Welcome to The Art of Charm. I'm Jordan Harbinger. The Art of Charm brings together the best coaches in the industry to teach you guys how to crush it in life, love, and at work. If you're new to the show but you want to know more about what we teach here at The Art of Charm, listen to The Art of Charm Toolbox at theartofcharmpodcast.com slash toolbox. Looking forward to meeting all you guys here at AOC. Today we're talking with Ty Lopez, a modern renaissance man. We're going to talk about how to deserve what you want, fighting the idea of the four-hour work week, and the offensively simple way to accomplish in a few months what takes everyone else a year. We're also going to talk about why it's crucial to go straight to the top when seeking advice, how to find the right field for you, and why humans are hardwired to be social. Last but not least, why competition actually makes us happy. And of course, the principle of the whole interview, the more you learn, the more you earn. And we're going to wrap with a fashion tip from Aaron Marino. So enjoy this one with Ty Lopez. I'm not even sure how to introduce you, man. You're an aspiring renaissance man. Most importantly, though, that sticks out is you read a book a day, which I honestly did not think was possible until I, I have an intern that does that. And it's probably the coolest thing ever. But you're the only other person I know besides him that does this. <laughs> I actually learned it from one of my mentors. He read a book before breakfast every morning, Alan Nation. And I, I remember I was 18 and I was like, that's impossible. But, you know, Peter Drucker, the great business guru, says most humans have to cope and deal with their disabling ignorance. And I think for most people, many things you think are hard aren't so hard. I, I've got this little inner circle where I mentor people. And this guy was at my house who lives here in L.A. And. He's reading a book a day, and, and it took him a year to just try it. And once he tried it, he's like, it's not very hard. I think I could read two a day. I'm like, yeah, Buffett, Warren Buffett, the billionaire, he reads uh, he reads eight hours a day. He clears his schedule. So for most people, you know that book, uh, Robert Kiyosaki's uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Sure. I, I didn't have a rich dad. I didn't have any rich. I had two poor dads or, or, or middle class or, or poor, my real dad and my stepdad. But I have rich friends and I have poor friends. I'm an investor now. That's probably the best way to introduce me. And, uh, you know, the good thing about being an investor, you get your hands in a whole bunch of situations and meet a whole bunch of people that have a ton of money. One of my buddies is actually here. Make He makes a million bucks a day. And so I have my old friends because I don't leave my old friends just because they don't have money. So I have rich friends and poor dad friends. So it's not rich dad, poor dad. It's rich friends, poor friends. Then rich friends read. Poor friends don't. If Warren Buffett and uh, Ma, Bill Gates were asked if you could have one superpower, what would it be? And they both agreed. With, they didn't know they were being interviewed with the same question. And they separately said, be the fastest reader in the world. If you can download the consciousness, the intelligence, the experience, the mistakes of the wisest people throughout history, what do you think that's going to do to your bank account? Sure. You know, what yeah. do you think that's going to do to the success that you have in life? It's so... You know, life is simple, but it's not always easy. And this is one of those simple principles. The sooner, and you know, is it one book a day? Is that the threshold? No, but one book a day is better than one every three days. It is If you can only read that, one book a week is better, better than one book a month. So it's a gradual, it's like lifting weights, man. Everybody wants a six pack of the stomach. They're like, oh, that'll impress women. That'll get me what I want. I'm like, what about a six pack of your brain? What makes homo sapiens the dominant force on the planet for the last 150,000 years is the brain, the neocortex. So you, the more you push it, without a doubt, like Buffett said, I went to the Berkshire Hathaway meeting, the shareholding meeting, sure. 15,000 richest investors really in the world show up there. And uh, he Buffett in the trade floor had this, he has this new uh, little company teaching kids uh, how to be successful and make money. And I bought his little child's book. It's like for eight year old animated you know cartoons and i open it up and the first chapter is the more you learn the more you earn and oh, i meet nice. all these people and i'm like you got to go back to fifth grade you got to go back to first grade and learn that it's not just about money either you know when it comes to women you know i'm an investor in some of the biggest online dating sites and i've owned nightclubs and i own one of the biggest uh modeling networks in the world so i've been around you know beautiful women for a long time some of the most you know number one models in the world and it's the same thing. You earn that too. And at some level, especially if you're a guy, everybody wants what they don't deserve. And like Charlie Munger, the self-made billionaire said, to get what you want, you have to deserve what you want. The world's not yet a crazy enough place to reward a whole bunch of undeserving people. But what people want in their dream, in their, I call it chasing the mirage, 
is they want what they don't deserve. And I'm trying to tell you, and Monger's trying to say, you won't get it. You want beautiful women. You want money. You want the good life, health, wealth, love, and happiness. It's yours to earn. Absolutely. That, that makes a lot of sense as well. Of course, a lot of people, there's a trend going on right now where it's like, hey, you know, you can start this podcast and make a bunch of money passively, or you can earn money from home, or you know, the four-hour work week, and we can get to all that stuff. No no hate on Tim. Obviously, he works well, well over four hours a week. It's just that that's a trend where people think, I can work really barely at all and still make money, and I think it's an unhealthy mindset. Uh, but backing up the truck a little bit, you were on Millionaire Matchmaker as well? I mean, what the hell? How did that happen? Well, that was back in, in 2007. I, one of my buddies was a casting director, and he came to me and he said, because I was on the second episode. It was still a pilot. You know, and my my buddy was like, "Hey, uh, do me a favor. I, I need I need young people to be on Millionaire Matchmaker. I got all these old millionaires. I need someone young." So I said, oh, "I don't want to be on TV, man." And he's like, "Dude, do me a favor. Nobody will ever see this show. It's just a pilot. I get paid if I cast it." So he finally talked me into doing it. And so I I was like, oh, "I don't want to do it," but my friend was in town, so I said, "We'll do it together." So uh, we yeah, I did that back in. And it, it became the number one most watched episode ever. So every time that Millionaire Matchmaker comes on around the world, my phone will get like, well, let's see. Right now I have 1,041 unread texts. It's not all from Millionaire Matchmaker. Probably 20% is. But I get, I'll get, i know my episodes on in Sweden and Norway. And so TV is a powerful medium, man. You know, media, that's what I'm focused on now. I mean, I live in the Hollywood Hills, so it makes sense that I'm into media. But... Media controls the world. Whoever could, the way that the human mind works can't separate fact from fiction. That's why you jump when you are in a horror movie, even though you know you're safe and secure. Or that's right. why Coca-Cola puts, you know, copy uh, puts celebrities holding the Coke, and uh, we subconsciously that's called the associative cognitive bias. There's 25 cognitive biases that cause us to decide or make mistakes, and the associative bias we go, well, if that person is at the Olympics and they eat McDonald's. Well, surely if I eat McDonald's, I'll end up at the Olympics. So it's a bias and uh, TV exerts that bias. I yeah. mean, many biases. My, my friend was in a McDonald's commercial and uh, she had to eat like a cheeseburger or a burger or something like that. And they actually, they have a bucket next to you so that you can spit it out instead of swallowing it <laughs> while you're shooting the commercial. And you know, it's not because like, oh, it's so disgusting. I mean, that's the, that's the joke, right? But right. Really, it's because you might have to do like 130 takes, and that's that's a, and you have to use a new burger each time. So, 130 bites of a cheeseburger or a Big Mac is a hell like that's you know like eating 14 Big Macs or something like that, which a, a 110 pound girl can't really do. Right, exactly. Physically, so they you bite into it and you go mmm, and then it's like cut, and then you're like Bleh, and you just, just barf it out basically. Just I mean, it's not you don't swallow it at all. You just shovel it out of your mouth with your tongue and then start over again after they touch up your lipstick um well the so. best thing the best thing about mcdonald's for me i just is the story of ray a Kroc. if you haven't picked it up it's a teeny book it's called uh grinding it out and it's his story you know how he went from selling paper cups and at 52 he hit he met the mcdonald's brothers part licensed it from them and built you know became the wealthiest man in america it's a, it's i love the title though grinding it out you know you're talking about four hour mentality and all this and uh i got in a little twitter battle the other day with tim ferris kind of popped into my twitter because i was talking with somebody uh on how I, I just don't see that philosophy as remotely accurate and uh so he popped in and we went back and forth on that and my buddy uh i got a pretty big twitter follower right? following i got 160,000 people or something so this guy sent me yesterday, I thought you'd like this, a quote uh, from a page with from Thomas Edison, the founder of you know GE. He also became one of the wealthiest people, has a thousand and I think 50 patents, basically invented electricity and started GE, which is at one point the biggest company in the world. He says, I was wondering what would have happened to me if some fluent talker had converted me to the theory of the eight hour day and convinced me that it was not fair to my fellow workers to put forth my best efforts in the work. I'm glad that the eight-hour day had never been invented when I was a young man. If my life had been made up of eight-hour days, I don't believe I could have accomplished a great deal. The country would not amount to as much as, as it has if the young men of 50 years ago had been afraid 
that they might earn more than they were paid for. So he's going, holy crap, thank God the world doesn't work on eight. I didn't work eight hours a day. And we got this mentality. And, not, I, you know, Tim Ferriss is a, a very smart guy. And uh, I'm not a hater on people's success. And he's been successful. But I'm all about accuracy. It's not about right or wrong to me. But if your goal is the good life, which I just – one of my favorite books and I think maybe the best book ever written is uh, an essay by Freud called Civilization and His Discontents. And he goes through what, what con- constitutes human happiness. And so if your goal is some level of fulfillment, human happiness, then we know what road you have to go up. It's not up for re- that much discussion. So four-hour work week brings – uh, to me, it's an inaccurate one if you're trying to get wealth. Uh, it does not bring fulfillment. I, I put it this way, and this is what I – when I was talking to Tim Ferriss on Twitter, I said, I said, look, if I came to you and I said, hey, Tim, I met the girl of my dreams. I'm so excited. Amazing girl. Uh, you've got congratulations. We're getting married. Oh, awesome. And then I said, oh, P.S., by the way, I figured out a way to only spend four hours a week with her. That's the <laughs> real exciting thing. Your response would be – any sane person's response would be like, Ty, are you sure you want to marry somebody that your main goal is not spending time with her? Why not marry someone where time becomes uh, a non-issue, where you want time – we all know when you're with the right person or doing the right thing, the famous uh, University of Chicago guy, he has a super long last name. He talks about – he calls it flow, optimal experience. Yeah, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, right? Yes. Yeah. I was just talking to Jonathan Haidt. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty good friends with a lot of the top. Uh, I mean, I have the biggest book club in the world. I'm an investor. I get access to pretty interesting people. And I was ta- I've talked to Jonathan Haidt a few times, and he's kind of the number one living guy. Him, Martin Seligman, and David Buss are pretty much the number one experts on human happiness. And, uh, you know, what makes you happy is nothing remotely similar to anything resembling a four-hour work week. What makes you happy is very simple. Uh, the good life, uh, obtaining some uh, levels of the good life, which are physical health. Now, me and Jonathan Haidt a little bit, you know, he's the University of New York. He's done three TED Talks, but we don't completely see eye to eye on the issue of health. He thinks physical health is less important. And, and in a sense, he's probably right to happiness. There's people who are happy that are diabetic and massively overweight. But I would argue that one all day, and there's good science. But But what we do agree on is, what Freud said a long time ago when he was asked what makes you happy. It's basically, in my German sucks, it's, you know, Schaffa and Liva. It's love and work. So you align those two things, okay? And so uh, you're going to get the good life. you got to be good on those. You have to get it. So there's a whole mentality here at Entrepreneurs. I do big parties at my house. I some I actually almost do the biggest one. According to the LAPD, I basically <laughs> do the biggest parties in Hollywood Hills. And sure. I did one last Thursday or a couple Thursdays. God, about five, six hundred people end up coming, and I got all these top entrepreneurs. Uh, and then I got all these people that are more pursuing this new thought of entrepreneurialism, and I see the difference. Right. All the guys that are old school are rich, and all the people trying to do lifestyle hacking and eighty twenty Pareto optimization. I'm like, I just told this to Tim Ferriss too. I said, Tim, if I read your book, and Bob, my neighbor, reads the book. We both outsource. We both do 80-20 Pareto efficiency, blah, 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 blah. Then we're even. Those efficiencies negate each other. We both are doing them. Then it becomes raw hours in. And so Elon Musk, you know, Cameron Diaz, I said my neighbor, they were dating or rumored to be dating. I got invited to this little thing with Elon Musk, and I heard him talk. And he said, you know, if you work 100 hours when everyone else works 40, you accomplish in three and four months what takes people a year. And if you do that long enough, Guess what happens? Yeah, you're You're, 10 years ahead of everybody else. Exactly, man. Well, look, I also – here's a – I've uh, developed this thing that a lot of people are interested in. It's the 67 steps. So I took – since I was 16, I've been trying to – I've always been fascinated by greatness, even from a little kid I remember, five, six years old. And so I've been compiling. uh, Some of it is just quotes, books that I've read. Much of it – I've been to 51 countries, read I don't know, 3,000, 4,000 books. Uh, I've compiled over these years quotes. You know, they're on my Evernote. They're on note cards. They're in my brain. And they're from, I've had five mentors, three multimillionaire and two at the billionaire level. And I have 12 business partners now in different events. What I do now, by the way, for a living, I 
go out, try to find the best people in any industry, and I cut a deal 50-50 with them. So I, I find people a hell of a lot smarter than me. Uh, I was just, I did a TED talk and I was in Europe and I went and I, and I bought a company in Eastern Europe with the number one guy there. So it's a compilation, these 67 steps of everything I've learned internally, but more importantly, what I've learned from people much smarter than me. And I've distilled them down. It's literally like 500 frameworks and principles. And I put it into 67. And one of these 67 is what I call the one tenth rule. Meaning whoever you copy and surround yourself with and idolize, at best, you're going to do a tenth. Uh, last week, I was with my buddy Edon Ravine, and he's the top um, trainer for all the pro af- basketball players. So LeBron James, Kevin Durant, all of these guys. And this principle he agrees with. So let's say I want to learn to play basketball. Most people copy from their friend who's pretty good at basketball. Right. Or a coach who's pretty good. You, yeah, if I copy... My friend, I'm never going to be as good at his style as he is, but if I copy Michael Jordan, even if I'm one-tenth of Michael Jordan, right. I'm pretty damn good you're, basketball you're damn player. You're, you're yeah. a pro-level le- yeah, pro exactly. athlete. So look at this entrepreneurial lifestyle or look at, you know, I know you're talking a lot about relationships and women. People are caught. It's the blind leading the blind. If you copy somebody who figured out how to make $1 million, at best you're going to make 100 Gs. So I ask people, I have no problem with you reading modern books, whether it's, you know, Lean Startup or, or, or Jim Collins or 4-Hour week, work week, No problem. But I'm going to ask you this. Before you read that, because first things first, did you read Sam Walton's book, which is $5 on Amazon? It's a paperback. It's called Made in America. The man made $160 billion for himself and built... I'll well, take a tenth of that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And when it comes to every avenue of life, you uh, go straight to the top. So part of the thing, there's so much noise in life. People aren't going straight to the top. Go to the top, and you'll be surprised what happens with osmosis. Amazing. And that makes a lot of sense. I think it. there's definitely ways to make yourself more efficient so you have more time to do what your core competencies are. But I think a lot of people fail at realizing that, and they instead look for the the way to use this as a shortcut to do less work so that they can go, oh, good, I don't have to work anymore. I can do things that I actually enjoy, like watching Netflix or whatever. And it's there's people that use these to become more effective, and there's people that use these to avoid doing work because they hate it. And the, that ignores the larger problem, which is if you're doing something that you don't like, then you're in the wrong field. Like Bud Williams says, he says, if you have to go on vacation from what you're doing, never come back. Or what Pablo Picasso said, you must avoid the dichotomy. The dichotomy is doing what you don't like in order to make cash to do what you do like. He said, do not do that. The great art, maybe the greatest artist of all time, made 51,000 pieces of art. Who would you rather be? Somebody who figures out how to automate some phantom mirage business, which will never hold. But let's say you could hold it and make 10 grand a month on autopilot. And then what do you do? Salsa dance across Argentina and, right. you know, do karate in China. Maybe that's exciting for some people, but we already know under a brain scanner, you're experiencing extremely low levels of dopamine and testosterone. The receptors aren't there. You're not that happy. So why pursue the mirage? You're not happy. Uh, Martin Seligman, the University of Pennsylvania, you know, genius. He, he put published work on learned helplessness, which is important into this conversation, but also on authentic happiness. And he already laid it out. The science is in. Three levels of happiness. You have hedonic pleasure, where you're just pursuing whatever, laying on a beach in Barbados. Right. You've got authentic uh, life and the meaningful life. And the higher you go up of those three, the more you want to be that person. You want to tap dance through life, man. It's not always getting what you – be careful. My men, One of my mentors, Joel Salatin, he's a pretty famous guy now, but he, he wasn't as famous when I started mentoring me. He said, you know, the worst thing in life is getting good at the wrong thing. And so many people are spending their life chasing the mirage, getting good at something that at the end of the day, if they were independently wealthy, they wouldn't be doing. Do what you would do if you are independently wealthy. Now, you may have to do a few twists and turns to get there, but, you know – And one of them, I know your shows, because I'm a business guy, but I'm also super into, you know, a lot of people are like, hey, you're the most social person ever. And when it comes to social, everything I'm talking about is the same. If you want to be good socially, if you want to be good, I'm assuming, by the way, 
and I'll jump in. What's that's a big part of what you talk about, right? Art of charm, women, social life, right? It has much more to do with the mindsets that you have as a man and much less to do with women and girls getting chicks. That right. stuff's that stuff's pretty unimportant in the scheme of things. Right, but but you know, I mean health I say in the good life you have the four, four pillars of life. So you have health physically, uh you have wealth, which is the acquisition of scarce resources. In the modern world we define that as cash in general. And then the third thing is social, which is uh, which is friends, family, and romance. Romance, for sure, is a massive part of us as a humans and species. It will be important. Your ability to attract a high-quality person into your life, to devote some level of their attention to you, it, 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 I mean, that's the perpetuation of the species. Right. So that, is, that is what determines your legacy. That's why it's so important to not get it wrong, and, and that's why we have the show, is because most guys will spend... A ton of time working on their career so that at the end of the day they can make money and then eventually father some children and then they spend 15 minutes on the other side of the equation where they get hooked up with a girl from freaking tinder and they're like oh she's pretty cute and then dot 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 suddenly you're in a relationship it makes no sense we don't focus on that other part that's so important so that we spend a lot of time here on the show teaching guys how to screen in the right type of people for them as well as deserving what they're what they want like we discussed earlier in the show well, I, you know, I, like I said, I, uh, for really, I don't know, 10, 15 years, I've been in the social business, whether I own some of the biggest nightclubs, I've invested in some of the biggest model agencies and, and, uh, and uh, now I own some of the largest online dating sites at my investment group. And I just did the key I've done for the last seven years, the keynote speech at the online dating and matchmaking company. So I've been around, you know, Helen Fisher, all this kind of stuff. And, you know, my life has been one big experiment. I lived with the Amish for two and a half years without electricity. Yeah, did, I want to know about date that. Anybody. How did you live with Amish people? Where and when? For, uh, of course, my why? Early, my early 20s. Because I, as I was saying, I'm all about experimentation. One of the things that makes humans happier is some level of experimentation. And I consider mistakes different than experimentation. I actually, that's a big thing in my 67 steps. I'm like, look, smart people are like Edison. Tons of experiments. But then when the, they read the signs, they move on. They move through the seven-step scientific method, you know, ask a question, uh, form a hypothesis, test it, observe it, analyze it, submit it to other smart people, rinse and repeat. And most people, like you said, with Tinder, it's like, okay, I met a girl, right? So your question was, how do I find a girl? Your hypothesis is Tinder. You then test it, but people forget the final steps. you got to observe the girl and the relationship you have, and after you observe – you should analyze it. it. Means I call it, you know, Blaise uh, Pascal, one of the greatest thinkers of all time. He said all a man's problems stem from his inability to sit in a room, you know, be alone. And you go into a room and you think, how's this relationship with this girl or whatever? When I was at the Amish, does this make sense for my life? Deep thought. I call it chess-like thinking. And then you go from there into submit it to other smart people. Run it by. The, there's a 5,000 year old proverb that says, make war with a multitude of counselors. So it's like the President of the United States has his cabinet, right? Secretary of Defense and Transit and, uh, and Energy. And these are the top people. They're not just random buddies, they're the best of the best. So if these people on Tinder or at my point when I was young and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, I ran it through that framework. Uh, probably didn't realize what I was doing, but the Amish made sense at that time. And I spent, two, I, I wanted to see what life was like non-materialistic. So, you know, I've lived, I grew up with no money. I mean, I lived in a mobile home when I was a teenager and um, in, you know, North Carolina for, I was born in California, but I, I bounced, I tried different things and I tried uh, the Amish as a tremendous experience. One of the great experience. I learned a lot about what makes humans happy. I learned a lot about uh, materialism not being attached. I mean, people, you know, I've done the Ferrari, Maserati, Beverly Hills Mansion, Hollywood Hills thing, and I'm not attached to it. Uh, there's upsides and downsides of both. But what I learned at the Amish um, is that humans are social, and you need to be part of something bigger than yourself. And this good book recently came out by Lieberman, the Harvard professor, uh, about, about it's called Social, actually. And we now know the hardwiring of the brain is its natural state. It will revert always to social thoughts. So it'll revert, and the Amish build their lives not as individuals, but as a group trying to accomplish something. And one of the things in the modern world, you have evolutionary mismatch. 
we're designed, for example, Robin Dunbar, the anthropologist from, I think, Oxford, he was famous for saying, humans are evolved to live in groups of 150. Our brain, our DNA and the wiring of our brain hasn't changed much sure. since 50,000 BC. That's why, that's why you should only have 150 Facebook friends, right, Ty? Uh, <laughs> well, you should, you should probably make a separate Facebook for your 150 you paid. I actually right. use an Excel spreadsheet that I put 150 my 150 most important people, and I check it a couple of times a month to make sure uh, I'm not doing what's called the misweighting bias, like talking to the wrong people more than the right people. You know, you got to double down on the good people. And when it comes socially, I mean, it's absolutely vital. It's funny, I'm here, you know, in Hollywood, and people come in and out, and I take people out from around the world. And when it comes to women, uh, I don't know what's up with dudes. I, I think. Well, I mean, I have my theories. I think it's the amygdala, you know, that part of your brain that's heavy on fear. Most one fear experience at any point in your life, uh, what they now know is that it's you cannot remove the fear. You get bit by a dog when you're five, you you'll jump at fifty. There's only one way that you can get Exposure rid of exposure therapy. Yeah, well, it, I call it MPFC. So fear annihilation, there's a part, another part of your brain right behind your eyes called the median prefrontal cortex. That part of your brain can actually generate, uh, if you fall off the horse and get back on, the fear of falling off is there in the amygdala. But if you get back on enough, you can potentially annihilate these things. But I mean, when it comes to women, let me just say, uh, the most advanced social skills you will ever need would become would be predicted to be with the opposite sex and reproduction. There's something sure. called selective proceptivity. Selective proceptivity is all species, basically, every mammal and basically every species. There's not a species on the planet where women will mate indiscriminately with men. So if you have, you know, you have an asymmetrical thing. Guys will mate with anything. Women have, trim or much less, Vicky. Women <laughs> have high levels Speak of Speak for yourself, Ty. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you have select. So then, what does that? What do you predict from that outcome? Well, you predict a world where men are constantly engaged in, you know, uh, uh, a hunt. Well, not just a hunt. It is not that. See, that is true. But it would only be true that it's a true hunt if you were the only person in the jungle. That's true. What it's more is it. It, it is, and there's, you know, I won't use too many scientific words, but in plain English. You're competing against other men, uh, and that is why all these concepts, whether they be for our work week or entrepreneurialism, come into play. You have to be able to compete within your gender, and you have to be good. Well, that's exactly true, and not only that, but you've got to be good in other areas. A lot of guys think, oh, I'm just going to get really fit and dot, 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 get girls, or I'm just going to be really smooth, dot, 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 get girls. No, you have to have everything else together because you're not just trying to capture her attention. And one, she's, you know, high-quality women are smart enough to filter through that crap too. But two, you're competing with other men who do have their stuff together in other areas. You're consistently competing for that, whether you realize it or not. If you disagree with that, it just means you're not in on the, on the you didn't get the memo. Hey, guys, I want to take a quick break for a second here. You've heard me talk a lot about taking you to the next level in life, at work, and in your relationships. And you've probably also thought to yourself, yeah, I want to up my game. I want to become a better man, a better boyfriend or husband, and a better person. And my guess is that you've been thinking about this for a long time. Am I right? Well, I'm here to tell you this. Stop thinking. Your chance is now. Do you really need more time, more information, and more plans for the future? Or do you want to become that guy today? Because the truth is this. You can be the guy who sits around and thinks about becoming better, and there's plenty of those guys out there. Or you can be the guy who decides that today is the day you're going to do something amazing. And I want that for you. Why? Because you've already got what it takes. The potential is there, even if you don't know it yet. Join me and thousands of other guys who've taken action in their lives at The Art of Charm. Call or email us, and we'll see if The Art of Charm can help you with your personal, relationship, and business challenges. All right, back to the show. Well, one of the things, you know, so we own, I own these sites and dating sites and we've got millions of customers. Okay. So I've, I've got more research than any university on the planet. We've had about 185 million messages sent back and forth. So I've seen it not only in my personal life anecdotally, but also hardcore numbers. And 
we we developed an actual system. I, I get asked all the time. People are like, you know, I did a party at this last Thursday one. I probably had 400 of the most beautiful girls in L.A. and 100 guys. And the guys are always like, Ty, what's the what is it? So I one day uh, about a couple years ago, I laid out what I think the um, what the secret to this thing of people call women or whatever. And when it comes to that specifically, what I define and I, the interesting thing, by the way, before I say it. I gave this talk, uh, I gave a keynote in Las Vegas uh, in January, and Dr. David Buss was there. So he's the number one evolutionary psychologist. I mean, he's the preeminent guy. Everything you see people talking about evolutionary psychology, whether it's the book Sperm Wars and Helen Fisher, they're all pretty much underneath. Buss is like the Michael Jordan of the world. So we've become really good friends. We're actually... Uh, co-authoring a paper with him all his textbooks are in harvard and all this and he actually came to me and he said because i had two like ford model girls with me so we he heard my speech and my talk where i laid out what i think how i think this thing called attraction works and he came to me at the end and he's like i agree with all of it except one point so he had one thing to add that was pretty cool and we become friends and he said look i want to do a paper on the most beautiful women in the world and they're harder to get access to so Let's co-author. So we're working on a paper of is the experience of the most beautiful women in the world. I dated a girl that's list. She's a guest model, one of the ones you see on the guest store. Like, mm -hmm. so he's like, are is their experience different? And my hypothesis is it's tremendously different. Uh, but you know, because I I once dated this girl years ago, and I remember she said to me, she's a Brazilian model here. It was actually a nightmare to date her because literally every single day there would be cars driving home after her, wherever she went. I mean, like pro baseball player. It wasn't like regular dudes. They, mm -hmm. they would go, and I remember I was talking to her, and she said something one day. She said, you know what, Ty? Uh, I heard some girl talking about how guys always try to have one-night stands with them. And she was from Brazil, so there's a little language barrier, and she was like, what do they mean by one-night stands? And I'm like, well, you know, they're trying to, like, sleep with you and never talk to you again. And she's like, you just saw this blank stare because – her experience is men, even the biggest player in the world, was like, I got a lot of chivalrous. No, he was chivalrous. He'd take her on a date and, you know, take her out and not even try to hold her hand. Just like everything you could do to signal, I want long term. So at the end of the day, every rule that you think there is, if you go up the scale and go up the notch, there's a whole different reality i just finished stephen hawking's book theory of everything and the level of realities like plato says you know most of us are in the cave we're seeing shadows but we think it's real and you got to step out of the cave into the light and so i laid out these tw i think there's 12 ways uh that when every woman on the planet sees you she her brain is a complex algorithm i don't care if you think she's a ditzy dumb blonde the she hears the whispers of ten thousand generations in her brain of her mother grandmother, great-great-grandmother, and they're probably smart in terms of selection, or you wouldn't be here right. on the planet. Scoreboard, and so right? I think there's 12 uh, heuristical patterns that they look through, and when it comes to like being in shape, that is one of them. So women are, are doing, uh, and different women, of course, weight, weight each factor slightly different, but what you really want to do is be strong. I find that women will give you a pass on two or three of the 12. But that's about it. If you want the best women, you must uh, at least master about nine of these. And so, you know, we laid all this out. It's pretty fascinating. If you follow, if I, if you follow this, I've taken dudes that are suck with women and gotten them. You know, it, they're just like mine. Forty-year-old virgins are like, holy crap. Let's take a quick time out for a sec. Some people think the Art of Charm live training programs are just about picking up girls, and honestly, there's some of that. One week with us, and you'll be rocking out in that department. I promise. But as a guy, I know how important it is to be awesome and well-rounded. And not just awesome with girls. You gotta be awesome at work, awesome at home, and awesome with your friends and family. Guys, we need to step it up everywhere. And that's why we call our company The Art of Charm. That special something that gets you results wherever you go. And trust me, the results are real. Every day I get new emails and calls from the guys who've decided to take our live training programs, and what I hear is simply amazing. Just weeks after graduating, they land a promotion, they form a new wolf pack, and they start a new business or find a partner. They have a new life, and it's not an accident. Call or email us, and we'll see what the Art of Charm live training programs can do for you. Now back to the good stuff. Give us, Go some, of, give us some of the 
the practical tips that guys can take with them uh, towards the end here? Because you've got a law of 33%, Stoic versus Epicurean. Of course, we already talked about reading a book a day. Give us dish on something that guys can pull the trigger on. Well, okay. So <clears throat> whether let's just say success in general, whether you want it with money or women or, or your body physically. My dad was one of the top bodybuilders, so it was interesting to grow up with my dad. He was Mr. Junior USA, Mr. Canada, and all this. And I kind of put some of this stuff, and I wasn't close with my dad, but I saw a few things, and it's funny. They line up with the 67 steps. I got a, I have a friend that I think is the best guy in the world with women. I kind of put all his stuff in the 67 steps. So practical stuff. You know, when I did my TED Talk, I said this. The law of 33%. If you follow this, you're on your path quickly. So you spend 33% of your time with people below you. Those are people that make you feel good about yourself. Your self-esteem goes up, plus you can mentor them and help them. Then you need 33% of people who are on your level. That 33% is like Mahatma Gandhi said in his autobiography. He said, you know, on your rise to the top, you will be, you will feel lonely. So you need people on your level, your peers, they become your friends. Most of us do that. Okay. In a day, you got 16 hours in a day. We spend most of our time with people below us or on our level. But this last one, if you could spend 33% of your time with people that are 10, 20 years ahead of you, this is where you get the burn. This is like you're lifting weights. You, there's no growth of muscles without some burn. You have to push yourself. These are people you feel uncomfortable around. These are people who are speaking a language that you don't even understand the words. They're doing things where you feel like you're insecure. They're laughing at you, right? Hopefully they're not doing it mean spirited, but they chuckle when you come around with your, you know, they've got a ripped six pack and you're coming around with your two pack. You, uh, you're stumbling and mumbling when it's around girls and they're, you know, just these Casanovas. Uh, when it comes to money, you're struggling to figure out how to get out of out of scarcity mode and they're in already in wealth and they're like what the hell is wrong with your level of reality Be like where are you man you can, if you can get around that and most people can't you know like we said stoic versus epicurean the stoics were people the greek philosophers who said toughen up they said they were them the ancient investors they said you have to forego pleasant present pleasure in order to get some greater future benefit. And there was the Epicureans, the opposite school of thought, which is YOLO, you only live once. Get what you want now, be a consumer. And I'm telling you, what the world doesn't need is 50,000 more people running after Louis Vuitton, Kim Kardashian, Paris Hilton lifestyle. What we need is 300 Spartans. Right. You give me 300 Spartans, we'll, I'll change the world, we'll change the world. And to get that, if you read about the Spartans, boy, there was a time when the Spartans, they would randomly pick someone out of the group tie him to a post and whip him. And half the time the guy died, whipped him to death for no reason. But the ones who made it through, just imagine life is like war and you're in a trench. Who do you want jumping in the trench with you? A guy with the scars on his back who made it through the whipping that most people died from? Or you want, you know, the pussy dude who who's figured out how to, you know, do his pedicures and sit on the beach and salsa dance across Argentina. You pick <laughs> You pit. What do you and have so, against salsa dancing, Ty? Damn. Actually, dude, I became, I was. It's funny because I people think about that tango and all that from this lifestyle engineering. And when I was in my twenties, I became a professional salsa dancer. So I can't make fun of it too much. I can make fun of myself, right? I'm allowed to. Absolutely. And there's nothing yeah. wrong with that. It's the mentality. If you want a salsa dancer, get a pedicure. In and of itself, there's nothing. But what place are you coming from? What reality are you coming from? You got to step out of the cave. And when you do. Here's the good news. Everything that people innately want becomes yours. You know, like I said, I got my buddy here. I, I actually have two friends uh, that, have been sta that are staying with me. And one of them, uh, it, he works for me. And, and he's, uh, I've kind of, I've put people through this white to black belt system. I got this like inner circle academy thing. And so he's been with me for a long time. I, I originally built it to help my employees help your to train and your employees, my employees. Yeah. I wanted to train CEOs because sure. I buy company. I just bought two companies last month. I, it's, I can't find enough good talent. So I was like, fuck it, I'll train it. Straight. So I train him, but he's still, you know, in the white and black belt, he's still like yellow or blue belt. And so his reality, it's like, how can I make $5,000 a month? And literally my buddy just rolled in last night. The million uh, dollar a day. He's dude. making a million bucks a day. And it's like, 
it's not an IQ thing. It's a reality thing. And it's this, dis- I'll tell you this, and I just uh, did on my podcast, it got a big response from this. Martin Seligman talks about, because you're talking about practical tips. So first practical tip is 33%. The next one is um, learned, you must eliminate the learned helplessness. And if you put a monkey in a cage and the zookeeper opens the gate and brings a pail of slop in at eight in the morning, noon, and six o'clock, what we know about that monkey is A, the monkey is learning to be helpless. B, because it's learning to be helpless, it does, it's not happy. If you study under a brain scanner, that monkey's brain, low levels of dopamine, all those complex reactions that make you happy. Now, that's yeah. interesting. So why why is that happening? Why is the unhappiness the monkey, a result the of helplessness? Because the monkey's meant to be in the jungle, man. It's meant to be the king of the jungle. It's meant to try. Now, being out in the jungle, sometimes you die earlier than if you're in the zoo. But you know what? Dying young in the jungle is better than dying old. Right. With somebody now. That's Epicurean, right? YOLO. You thought Drake invented it, but it was Epicurean. <laughs> exactly. And, and then what's fascinating is even when you take the monkey out of the cage, and you stick it, a wild animal, a domestic animal, you stick it out in the jungle, guess what happens? The fruit's all around it. It could hunt in the jungle. But it's learned and had its brain rewired so strongly that guess what? It sits there and starves to death. Now, the modern world, most of us, think of how you grew up. How'd you get educated? You went to first grade, second grade. Did they tell you just the end goal and say, there's the library, you figure it out? No, no, no. They spoon feed you like you the zoo. That you were the monkey in the cage. The teacher comes and goes. Okay, we're going to learn about American history. First, we all read chapter one together. Chapter two, you are force feed education. So I'm going to tell you this. If you're listening to this, the odds are, and this happened. This is true for me, and it's true for you. I'm not pointing fingers. I'm right here, having been through through that same educational system. You have been taught that to learn and to grow. Somebody's going to come to you, and I'll tell you this. There's never going to be a day when I check my Facebook and Bill Gates is going to have dropped me a little email and said, Hey, Ty, I read your blog. You're such a fascinating guy. I'm on my jet down here to Hollywood to hang out with you. That'll never happen. That might have happened to me in first grade where knowledge was uh, spoon-fed to me. You want to learn from Bill Gates? You show up. I've been mentored and been able to become friends with some of the top billionaires in the world. You pursue it. That's, That's not You go out in the jungle. You hunt for yourself. When it comes to, you know, learn helplessness with women, like you said, most guys are like, ah, Tinder's going to be my thing. I'm just going to, I'm just the monkey in the cage. And if Tinder brings me the girl, whatever it brings me, I'm just going to take. No, you're the king of the jungle and I'm bringing you out in the jungle. That's the new realm of reality you need to be. Be in the real world, my friend. The real world is one where their competition is stiff. But the good news is if you compete, you will become happier. You are the product of men who competed and won. You can win, you can win, but if you won't, aren't, then you're just a cog in this machine and the cog, you never, like the old saying goes, when you're in a room and you don't know who the sucker is, you're the sucker. You never want to be the sucker, you never want to be the cog. So that second thing is literally, mentally making a shift, snapping your fingers and going, I'm in the jungle. In the modern world, I just got an, I get hundreds of emails almost a day from people around the world. I got one a couple of weeks ago. This person said, hey, I've started this architecture company. I'm only making about 45 grand a year. I feel like I plateaued. I'm reaching out to you. Will you help me? He's out in the jungle saying, I need mentors. Help me. Help right, me. Smart. Right. Then he PSs it at the end. Oh, by the way, I just turned 15. See, that's the jungle. The jungle's awesome now. You got never before have people been able to accumulate wealth at the way they have without being born into it. Now you can. The Sumley kid, 15 years old, 30 million bucks. That uh, Gerbosh Chardall guy making a couple hundred million dollars before he's, he's not yet old enough to sign the contracts. I don't care if you're young or old. Ray Kroc was 52 when he started. Uh, uh, Colonel Sanders was, I think, 65 or 66. I don't care where you are. Stop measuring your life backwards by the age from when you are born. That's the old school way. Like Stephen Hawking says, time is measured in three ways, thermodynamic, cosmological, and, uh, and psychological, and all of them move forward. So the way you should be measuring your life is not how many years since I came out of my mom's belly. You should be measuring yourself forward how many years do I have left. And since you don't know how many years you have left, yeah, exactly. you have to act as if today is the day and then you don't want to be too hasty because the odds are you'll live for a while but you got to do like the great 
greatest of all basketball coaches in college, John Wooden, the UCLA coach, said, be quick, but not in a hurry. Or Joel Salatin used to tell me, make haste slowly. So if you're listening to this, today's the day. You stop the mentality of, I'm going to be forced fit. What you want, you go out and get. And I'll tell you this, when I walk in a room with that mentality and another guy is in a state of learned helplessness, which one do you think the most beautiful girls and the women want to be around? I'll tell you what's attractive to women. People call it alpha, this. It's not about alpha. I know shy guys. Yeah, that's know. not a real thing anyway. It's just yeah. something made up by marketers to sell supplements. Well, it's like, like cocky, funny, you know, that whole thing. That's not true. The man, I mean, honestly, if you want to study who was the best with women, Casanova still remembered three, four hundred years later. He said you have to play the chameleon. But I will tell you, the underlying energy that's attractive to women is somebody who is not in the cage. It's, it's a win-win for you. You get out of the cage, you're healthier, you're wealthier, you're happier. And socially, people pick it up on it. So that's the third, that, you know, that's the other thing. I would say the last thing uh, it, that you have to do, uh, and it's related to the law of 32%, you got to have a mentor, man. You have to. It's like Charlie Munger says, I don't believe. Uh, I believe in mastering the discipline of learning from other people. I don't believe that you can sit around and think it all up yourself. Nobody's that smart. Nobody's that smart to figure out women on their own. So you got to listen to stuff like, you know, Art of Charm. You have to make the, and I tell people, so this is part of this final thing. I call it the $32,000 Amazon educational budget. Last year, I looked through my, I had my account. And I was like, pull how much I spent on Amazon. You know, most of it, some of it's supplies, most of it's books and stuff. I spent 32 grand. You got to spend 33% of your disposable income and your disposable time. You need a Kindle, bro. <laughs> nah, forget that. I like the book scattered, man. I'm old school. But my last thing to you is, Spend your damn money, spend your time, not as a consumer who's a sucker, buy an average American as a $33,000 car. Why? Why? The average American makes 48 grand, they spend 33. Don't buy a car, jog or ride a bike, you'll be in shape, then double down on all the money that you save, like Jack Welch, when he took over GE, grew it to the biggest company in the world, maybe the greatest CEO of our time. He took all the companies that, weren't, that he couldn't uh, be number one or number two in, he closed them down, took the money, doubled down on what he can do. So double down on your brain, double down on surrounding, listen to more hours of podcasts, Art of Charm, buy more books. Michael Jordan is a fascinating guy because he was the cockiest of almost all basketball players in history, of all athletes. Yet, he was a dichotomy, and the other side of him was he had such high levels of humility that every coach who ever coached him said there was no one who listened and was more teachable. And I tell people, you better learn faster. You better, you don't wanna be like Steve Jobs said, I didn't wanna be the richest man in the graveyard. If you think you will learn by going internally and learn through mistakes, you will run out of years in your life. So Sam Walton became the richest man in America. I think by that time he was the richest man in the world. He took a trip to Sao Paulo, Brazil. He was down there, the host family got a phone call and they said, uh, that, that call said, uh, uh, come pick him up and bail him out of a jail. He's in jail. Of course, they rushed down there. A 60-year-old billionaire in a Brazilian jail is a, not a good thing. Not a right? good idea. Yeah, <laughs> not, not a, a good, good look. Idea. They show up. They say to the police, they say, hey, uh, why'd you arrest this guy? And they said, well, we thought he was insane. We found a man, old man, crawling around on the floors of different department stores aisles in, uh, in Sao Paulo. And so they turned to Sam Walton and said, what were you doing? And he said, I was just trying, I was measuring with a tape measure how wide the floors were because I was trying to see if these Brazilians knew something that I didn't know. That humility to get on your hands and knees and crawl around on floor is the humility you will need to get the good life. And most people, even though they listen and fill up with knowledge, they're not like Michael Jordan. I'm unconcerned with the level of cockiness you have externally. I'm a relatively cocky person external, but internal, the reason I read a book a day is because I go, I don't know. The second you get out of that state, man, the world opens up to you. Learn from the best. They're right there. They're there in books. They're there in YouTube. They're there in audio. They are there uh, all around you. They're even there in person. Find those people 
learn more, read a hell of a lot more. Don't ever listen to people that say the answers are all within. They're a little bit of it, but most of it's outward. He didn't learn English inwardly. He didn't sit in a room and come out speaking fluent English. It came externally. And everything you want will come from that same attitude, but it will start. And the stumbling block for most people is deep down, they go, I still know. You must come to a place where you're like Michael Jordan and you're like, he actually said, if Dean Smith, my UNC coach or Phil Jackson said to me, hey, that seems wrong. He said, Jordan said, even if I thought they were incorrect, I still listened. You got to get to that place because what is correct and true for you will make you feel uncomfortable and it will feel incorrect. So if you only go by your gut, you're not going to get there. So I hope that's been helpful for your group. Absolutely, man. Thank you so much. All right. Hope you guys enjoyed that show. Deserving what you want and how to get there is a key concept and becoming that modern renaissance man is a great step on the way there. I hope you guys enjoyed that. It does seem to come down to working hours and productivity at the end of the day. But, of course, you can always go straight to the top, get some great advice, get some great mentorship, and get an edge on everybody else. Get out of the cage, guys. Now, check out this fashion tip with Aaron Marino. Due to popular demand, we got fashion tips from my man Aaron Marino from imalphaM.com. He's going to be dropping some knowledge on us to learn how to dress our best. All right, I haven't seen this for a long time, especially in California, but I know around other parts of the country slash world, baggy pants are still in, or maybe they're back. I don't know. Look, here, here's the deal. Baggy pants make you look shorter. They make you look heavier. They make you look less attractive than you are. Uh, you know, and, and it's not that guys are seeking out a baggy pant. It's just that they're putting it on. It fits in the waist. They're not paying attention to the leg dimension, the, the rise of the pant, and they're like, whatever. It fits in the waist. It's not too long. I'm good. Well, the reality is, is that a lot of pants, if they are cut standard, they're going to be big. They're going to be baggy. I always recommend for guys, size down try the smaller size you know if it's too too tight and you feel like you know you're 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 smuggling you know grapefruits in the front it's just (laughs) way too (laughs) smuggling grapefruits we should be so lucky right (laughs) you know if if it's just too tight then okay go up but you want to make sure that you're looking for a pant that is that is fitted and once again fitted does not mean tight it simply means you're cutting out the extra fabric excellent yeah because it doesn't have to be super like skinny jeans ridiculous but a lot of guys wear these different sizes up, especially if they lose weight, which props, by the way. But they'll do something where they're like, oh, you know, I'll just get a size up so that they're comfortable. And then they do that thing where they cinch it tight with a belt. And you can kind of see where it's like really sucking in at the waistline and then baggy down below. And it looks really awkward. No, they just totally negated all the hard work that they put into losing that weight. You know, it's you know they, they, they might look great out of their clothes, but when you're wearing clothes that are way too big, oversized, it's just throwing everything off. Wear clothes that fit, always. For more from Aaron Marino, search for Alpha M on YouTube or go to imalphaM.com. Solid show as usual, if I do say so myself. Show feedback and guest suggestions. We rely on you guys to help keep our finger on the pulse. So if you know someone who's a good fit for the show, let us know at jordanh at theartofcharm.com. Boot camp details, that's our live training at theartofcharm.com. And that's also where you can find links to us on Twitter, Facebook, and other social media. If you're listening to this but you're not subscribed in iTunes or Stitcher, then that needs to change. Getting our shows delivered free to your phone or computer is the best way to make sure you don't miss anything. You can do that by going to iTunes and searching for the Art of Charm podcast or by going to theartofcharm.com slash iTunes and clicking subscribe. That's it. You guys can also help us. If you subscribe in iTunes or Stitcher, give us a five-star rating and write something nice. We'll love you forever. Just go to iTunes.com slash theartofcharm and it'll take you right there. When you write us a review, it not only makes us feel proud, but it helps keep us in the ranks so that other people who can use this information can find the show more easily and get the credible advice that they need. It's also the best way to support the show other than purchasing training from us. So tell your friends because the greatest compliment you can give us is a referral to someone else, either in person or shared on the web. So have a great week. Go out there and get social and leave everything better than you found it.